They say that prison is where the scum of the earth go to, or the losers or the drop kicks of society. But it's not, man. Prison is like God's jewelry box, man. And in there, he's got diamonds, he's got rubies, he's got sapphires in there. And he's polishing them up. When you come out of there, you know what happens is when the light hits a diamond or hits a sapphire or whatever, it like just spreads and multiplies. Every area of your life is going to be blessed. Young soldier of God. Steady march. Steady march. Dear Heavenly Father, please watch over me and the brother here. Um, please speak through us and please speak to everybody watching right now and please bless them as well. In Jesus' precious and almighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, my doko. Well, what's your name, brother, and where are you from? My name is um, Simone Molisi Latu, but my friends call me Mone, better known as Mone. Uh, my parents are from Tonga. Um, and I'm um, I was born and raised in Auckland, New Zealand. Yeah, born and raised in Auckland, New Zealand, brother. Bro, welcome to the Fallon Show, man. I'm wrapped to have you on, brother. How's your day going? Good, man. It's an honor to be here. Privilege, man. Thanks for having me on, Togo. Nah, yeah. bro, it's, it's a privilege to, to have you on, bro, and be able to share your story, man. So, um, man, a little bit about the brother Moni here. So, um, Bro, he's he's uh, watch out for this guy. You know what I mean. He's gonna um he's got some big things planned. You know he's um currently you know um working on a youth service provider called um New Leaf, which is gonna implement you know different sort of youth um programs um including their big doko program that they're working on now. So this is all um pretty big news. You know the doko was recently on the news um as well. Just um. Speaking on, um, obviously, you know, here in New Zealand, there is, a, if you want to call it a bit of, you know, gang violence and things like that, not just here in Auckland, but across the Motu. And that's for a range of reasons. I mean, it's hard to really pin down one cause of that. You know, it's obviously a multitude of different things that that creates these sort of situations, man. But, um, you know, the Doko and um, one of the other brothers, Patani, was um, on the news recently sort of speaking to... Um, the violence that's going on you know it's unfortunate um but you know the 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 big doko here has actually um walked that path himself you know um how we connected was actually in person we connected through the grace foundation which is through dave latelli senior so you know much love to the to the also over there as well yeah so the brother's actually been out of jail for coming up on two years now um, which is a massive ch achievement. He was actually um, sentenced to life um, back in the early 2000s, um, you know, in what you could say a former life in a way. Um, he was sentenced to life and he, um, the brother served 17 years, almost 18 years of that life sentence. He's obviously out now on parole um, and he'll be on parole for the rest of his life, you know, so again for the brother to be you know doing what he's doing now um man praise god you know what i mean uh, praise the lord man he he makes right. the he makes the impossible possible you know what i mean he, he you know just all glory to him man for um for for moving these mountains and and for getting these things done you know there's definitely a revival in the air you know a lot of brothers and sisters getting together trying to make a change man and putting god at the center of it so we're ready to flood the country, man, <laughs> with the gospel, <laughs> with the good news. But now, nah, I mean, Doko, so again, thank you for jumping on, man. Really appreciate it. And to be able to provide the space for you, man, to share your story and to, to get it out there across New Zealand, across Australia and across the world, brother. So, um, I mean, where did it all start, brother? So here in Auckland, eh, brother? So you're, you're, you're from here in Auckland? Yeah, yeah. Born and raised here in Auckland, uh... My parents come over from the islands back when New Zealand was going through the industrial boom, factories and things like that. And my parents were uh, one of many, many Pacific Islanders who came over and got straight into the into the um, industrial in, in, into the industries and started working. Uh, Dad was involved in uh, in gangs. He was absent a lot of the time. Doing what he does. Uh, Dad was actually a barbarian stormtrooper back in the day. So I grew up knowing about that life and that. But because Dad was gone, um, 
we grew up with mum. Mum was is an Orthodox Catholic, you know, she's a staunch Catholic, and she raised us with Catholic with church values, um, taught us to pray, taught us to trust in God from a very young age. So I'm not one of those guys, bro, that that um that, that was born into a hard life, doing a hard home. Home was okay, you know, it was a church family, very uh, mom's very religious and and that had a lot of rules, a lot of strict rules around the house, not only with our tongue and morals and customs and that, but just our own little family values and that at times it was a bit much for me, man, you know. I was, um, yeah, I always wanted to run away. I always wanted to get away and go do what I wanted to do. I felt restricted. I felt like, yeah, you know, I wanted to go and see the world, bro. I wanted to go and know the world. So we didn't even know we had a granddad in that until he was dying and he came, found us, took us to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it was, yeah, it was quite quite funny. We'll go and finish church. We'll sit down and have lunch and we'll be doing the old Father, Son, Holy Spirit and all the series, the series of going, hey, hey, man, we don't do that, man. I'm going, oh, sorry, man. It was funny. <clears throat> but that's when we started going to the church. When he died, uh, Dad took us to the Auckland Tong and said, went to church, which was just growing at the time. And and our family was one of many families who built it, bro. Built it up. Um, we went from renting halls, school halls, to um to buying a buying a place and building a, buying an old jewelry factory and then building it to what it is today. Wow. But uh, yeah, by the time I turned 16, bro, I left home, bro. You know, so I was fine, I, I was on the streets, bro. I always stayed out east in GI. Um, school wasn't working out for me and all the pressure. And then I uh, I started to rebel, just started running away and then and, and just didn't come back. You know, I just, just gone, bro. Left. Uh, found myself in a relationship by age 19, serious. Uh, when I was a dad, you know, so came into hardship with um, those things. I ran with a crew back in the day. JFK, just different crazy. Um, and they're all Crips, Tom and Samoans, all from Mount Wellington. Um, just to run around, getting drunk, having fights, having fights with bigger gangs, proper clubs and that. But we were known for um, for being crazy and, uh, yeah, having nuts that are bigger than our brains sort of thing, you know. But it was, all, you know, all fun and games. We were young. But then, um, yeah, the boys uh, we all started wanting money, started getting into the robbery scene and stuff like that. But it was a progression. We started um, burglaries, um, what was called stair dancing at the time. We would creep the um, buildings in town, um, looking for whatever, laptop safes, um, whatever. And we used the fire exits as a getaway because it was never locked, you know, so we always got away. So that became dubbed steer dancing by the news. Um, progressed into armed robbery, aggravated robbery, armed robbery, things like that. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, bro, um, the heat came on. Our guys, my partner at the time, my first wife and I, father of my son, John, we weren't getting along, so, uh, yeah. Decided to make a move. We had to move to um, Australia. Yeah, about 20. 20 years old, 21. Left. So, yeah. at, so at 21, you ended up moving to Australia. So, um, I mean, JFK, so that is a quite a well-known crew. You know what I mean? So you guys obviously had a reputation and things like that. Bro, NWA dropped. Um, Snoop Dogg dropped. Dr. Dre, The Chronic and all that. And, bro, that music is all influential, bro. You know, we listen to it. We're part of that era. And it just influenced us, bro. And um, it, 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 it just solidified beliefs that we had that they were talking about then and there, you know. And, you know, you grow older and wiser and you find out that's just entertainment. It's just their job, man. A lot of them don't actually do the things they talk about. That's but it's, the thing. That's yeah. good on taking it on board, growing up as kids and like, we're doing it, man, you know? That's the thing, eh, brother? I mean, um, 
because it's the same now, you know what I mean, with the music that's coming out nowadays with the drill scene and things like that. It's entertainment, you know what I mean? Like a lot of them aren't actually doing any of those things. Back then it was just like drugs, alcohol, chasing girls, having a good time, hitting the clubs. Um, it wasn't until the boys started to get into the robbery scene that was getting serious, guns, things like that. But, you know, it was friendly back then. It was like, you know, we were kids. Things today are much worse, man, than it was back then, you know. Back then we used to, like, fight, you know, first fight. Every now and then you hear of a stabbing. Something went too far or something like that. It wasn't that bad. It was all fun, you know, if I can be honest. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the main difference, I guess, now is it's guns, you know what I mean? And when you're playing around with guns, it doesn't take much and someone's dead, you know what I mean? And then someone's sitting in jail, you know, it's just everyone loses, mate, the families lose and all of that. I mean, brother, so how, how was it, man, when you went to Australia? You know, like, did you end up going by yourself or with your family or? Yeah, yeah, we a partner. Well, son, we try to look for, try to have a new start, you know. By the end of it, I was frequenting the cross, and it was like, just like <laughs> you know, I had, I had a little son that I had to raise, and that was very, it was a culture shock over there. It's very racist, even for those days, you know. You know, you get a lot of other um, mixed cultures there, and it's just like over here with dominant culture, all the islands, there's heaps of us in South Auckland. Over there, they're like, there's way more other cultures and they're dominant, you know. You your Middle Eastern brothers and all that. Yeah, it's just, just a different world. I didn't want to raise my son there. So in um, 2003, we came back. But um, back to the struggle, you know. Everything's expensive. Um, underqualified, could get a minimal paid job. But um, I had the heart to go out and do what it took, you know. Get that easy money, rob. Robbery, it's what I knew. So um, came back, got back into that scene, fell in with a couple of people, met someone from a mutual friend, and I decided, look, we want to do some business. Um, open up second hand uh, electronic store. Uh, I was already heading in for robbery, you know, I was heading inside, so I was sort of out on bail. And I wanted to set something up before I went away. So that I could sort of sustain the family, sustain, you know, while I was gone. That turned sour. Um, um, and the person that I wanted to go into business with started getting heavy and uh, making threats to my home, making threats to my son. And uh, I just took it all literally, you know. If I knew then what I knew now, I wouldn't have gone as far as I did. You know, it's just scare tactics. But once the home was threatened, my son was threatened, I made a conscious decision that I was going to take the guy out, you know. I was not going to let that happen. So I um, so I did it, man. I planned it, made my move, you know. But unfortunately, it cost him his life, you know. And it's, uh, it devastated his family, it devastated my family. And my life from that point on had changed forever, you know. Well, but also, I mean, it's just escalated like crazy coming back from Sydney. I mean, um, you've gone from, you know, obviously becoming involved in holdups on bail, so you've gotten done as well. Like you said, your mentality is obviously disillusioned basically brother you know what I mean because when you're in that life you are disillusioned you know what I mean I'm sure you can see that in hindsight yeah you're like you're caught up in your own movie bro you know exactly the world's against you that's right the pace was over there the pace over there was like that you know was, and I come over here and it was slow I was still operating on that pace bang so I landed in March bang started going hard April, May, June, July August, September by October I was sitting up at the rock Remanded for every robbery, arson, murder, you know, 24 years old. 24 years old. And that in a span of a couple of months, March to October. Well, so, I mean, um, I uh, say so you found yourself at the Rock, brother. I mean, um, 
hell was that for you, man? Like, you know, sitting at the rock, man, you've been arrested, you know what I mean? So looking at what you're getting, what you're looking at, I mean, how was that? How was your whole mental space during that time, bro? Was it sort of if the world type thing? Or was it just how was your how was your mentality, bro? I think it was still um because the type of person that I was at the time it was I still had lost touch with reality, bro. You know, so I've gone from to nobody to I was the talk of the town, you know, by that time. Because of the, my crime, the nature of my crime, how it went down and the way that it affected the underground, you know. The message that it was sent. And um, and that further added to that disillusionment, bro, you know, because now I'm coming on the news every time I go to court, I come back and I'm getting all this respect from, from like, real gangsters, you know, real gangsters, bro, real people who were born into it, who grinded it out, grew up in a hard life and, you know, and all of a sudden, um, you know, I'm getting props from them, you know, they're giving me, like, you know, you know, and these are people I heard about on the outside, never met, you know, but I heard about them. Um, at the time I came through, everyone who was anyone at the time was at the Rock at that time or up top, which is where I ended up, right up, up at uh, Maxi, Marimba Marimba Maxi. Um, yeah, yeah, so everyone who was anyone was there at the time and I met them all, got to know them all, um, learned from them all. Um, how to, because it took them all of like a couple of weeks or more to figure out that I, I have a good nature, I have a kind heart, I'm a loving person, I'm not this person that they saw on the news, I'm not this, you know what I mean? I have a family that come and see me every week and they love me, you know what I mean? So to them, I was like, bro, <laughs> what happened, you know? What happened, bro? <laughs> What are you doing, you know? But this is how that life can lure someone in, you know? The trappings of the life can lure someone in, especially someone young who's struggling, trying to make it. A lot of the kids today are faced with those same things, bro. The poverty. It's not outright poverty, but it's the struggle, bro. You know? Everything's so expensive. And because of the way the system's built, they're... Um, you know, they're unable to tap into their greatness, to tap into what, to their gifted, the, the, the talents that they're born with, you know? So, because it's all academics, so. So you ended up getting sentenced. Um, I mean, bro, how was that, man? You know what I mean, bro? How, how was that, you know, getting sentenced to that? By that point, bro, had you already sort of settled into to, to life in there and, and um. I mean, what were your plans, man? I mean, could you see could you see the light at the end of the tunnel at all, brother? Or was it just, well, I'm here now, got to do what I got to do in here type thing? Yeah, it was, um, I had a mind switch, like my life isn't here now. You know, this is my life now, this is it, this is going to be it until they let me go. I'm only young, I'm going to make my name, I'm going to build, you know, I'm still, still in that mind state, bro. Um, and I just started going hard in there, man. You know, running around like an animal. But there were times right through that 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 where um, where uh, I call them the Jesus people. Jesus people used to come through there, man. They'll come through and they'll. I had a Tongan lady pass the loot there, and they'll forget her. As soon as my thing came out on the news, made Tongan news, and that she came to the rock to see me, visit me, and I was like, okay. I was cooked, man. I was like, puffed wheel, like stone, puffed came straight from the yard. They called me. I came and sat down. And this lady sat down and she um, just started crying, uh, told me who she was, why she was there. And I was like, oh, thank you for coming to see me. You know, don't come back. I'm all good. I'm just, I'm sweet. I pray, which I did. You know, I pray every day, bro. You know, it's taught that from a young age. Trust the Lord, you know. Yet this lady kept coming back. She made me read the Bible, and I'm like, man, I'm high, man. You're killing my buzz, bro. You're making me read the Bible, bro. You know? Who is this woman? Why does she love me the way she does? She doesn't even know me. I'm a piece of shit, man. I'm a fucking piece of shit. 
I've done bad. Why does she come and treat me this way, you know? But something starts growing me then from interactions with this lady. And and many other uh, brothers and sisters like yourself that came in and met me over the years. People used to come into the churches. And I always used to attend church even though I was inside. I still go to church, you know. It's a habit. I'm a creature of habit, bro. Every now and then I'll hear something. Every now and then someone would come in with a... You know, someone will come in with the fire, bro, and light us all up, you know. And we're like, yeah, man, yo, I remember that. I remember that feeling, you know. So every now and then I was reminded, God, you know, he didn't let me just go. You know, he kept reaching me, you know, in that place and going, hey, remember, I love you. Remember, yeah. When did it sort of kick into gear, brother, of, you know, the mindset of I don't want to keep doing this stuff when I get out, you know what I mean? And I don't want to, um, I don't want to make a bunch of money and things like that. But the when the when did that sort of a mentality kick in for you, man? <sighs> to be honest with you, it was like really, really late in the piece. Yeah. Like between that, I'd gone on and I'd started a prison gang. I started one, um, it was more of a fight clubbing gang. Um, I went on and, Stopped doing that, carried on, went and became part of, you know, joined an actual gang, a club. I actually started doing things from inside. And it wasn't until, like, near the end of it when my, you know, I see my parents getting older and my son growing older. And, my, you know, they were faithful to me all the way. No matter where I went, they followed me. If I sent down to Wellington, they show up for visits at Wellington, you know? And it was like, to me, it was like, you know, you, for me, I couldn't continue doing the bad stuff, you know, knowing that my family are there for me and they, they're hopeful and they're praying for me to change, you know, and they, you know, what kind of a piece of shit would I be if I continued and still, you know, still live their life doing, you know, doing all the bad stuff. So something clicked in my heart. Seven years later, um, I met somebody. I didn't know at the time that this person would be the mother of my daughter. Now, you know, that would be anything. When I first met this person, you know, I just thought, another disillusioned sister coming in here trying to change the world. Good luck to you. You know, stay out of my way. I was always used to talking to officers and stuff and, then she left, left the job. I thought, oh, well, it's not meant to be. You know? At that time, bro, I was, still, um, I was still operating. I was still operating from inside, still being a crim. They would charge me. They would try to pin charges against me, all sorts of charges against me. And they would just thought, you know, none of the charges were stuck. You, know, you do enough jail, you read enough books, you read law, you sort of know how to, un, you know, you know, how to play the system, through the system. And they had enough and they kicked me out of Auckland. They were like, get the hell out of here. Kicked me down to this farm prison in Te Awamudu, Waikiria, good old Waikiria. On the way down there, I was like, talking to God. I was like, what's going on? Where are you taking me now? Because even up to that point, I was like, where I, I went, I knew he was leading me. And we, where are you taking me now? So he took me, I went to this prison. Yeah, she came. He started visiting me every weekend. Every weekend, right up to my release. Bro, that's incredible, brother. That um, I mean, again, praise God, isn't it, brother? I mean, he provides the life, bro. So I mean, to to provide, you know, while well behind bars as well, and in a time when it sounds like it just was needed, bro. You know what I mean? For you to make that uh proper transition, like you said, man. So you're you're you know neck deep in the in the game in there, bro. You're um. Like you said, man, you've formed the prison gang in their fight club type thing, bro. I mean, well, bro, can you go into into that at all, bro? The the fight club thing, man. So was that just like a a Norlin brawl thing in prison? Was it? Uh no, no. It's just like we will train together, um, and then we fight, man. We will train, and then we have fights, we have rounds. Um, I started a team called uh, Predator, Team Predator New Zealand. And everyone that, that, that I trained, everyone that trained with me, 
finish the fights fast in devastating fashion. Uh, wasn't many of us because the standard of our training and the way we trained and that was not many people made the cut, you know. So, so that was good and it was going good for a while. It started getting political. It started going somewhere where I didn't want it to go, you know. So uh, I, I cut it off. I left it, you know. I shut it down. It was about the fights, the training, the handshake after the fight. If you lost, there was a round two. There's going to be a part two and that. And we all lived for that. I mean, we'll throw, we have wages and stuff like that. Um, it was about that. It was all underground. It wasn't No one knew about it. And then we see all the stuff on TV and they're giving it a bad rap. And then so they just started climbing down on the fight training on the inside. I found it quite therapeutic for me. And then all of a sudden, we're not allowed to do it. So I focused my energy into other things like uh, making money, getting back into that, you know? Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. So, like you said, bro. So, you're deep in it in there, man. Obviously, um, making moves, making money from behind bars as well. Obviously, the police and the screws are getting onto you as well. So, I mean, so that's what you're getting involved with in prison, bro. So, how how is it, man, making that transition, bro? You know what I mean? Like, was it an easy transition to... I mean, how did you start, bro? Did you start doing courses in that, bro? Like, to help with the rehabilitation? And like, how how did you start making those steps to freedom, I guess you say, bro? Yeah, today, actually, I went into the violent propensity course. It's called the STIRP back then. Uh, special treatment. Uh, it was a special treatment unit for, for violent offenders. And I went into that because um, I was really starting to struggle when they shut down the fight training because I needed that every day. And when they stopped that, I needed to do something and, you know, prayed about it. God got me in there, you know, into that, that unit. And I started my reintegrate, my rehabilitation. And I picked up a lot of tools doing that program. Um, how, to, how to slow my thinking down, slow my anger down. As soon as something happened, you know, I'd slow it down, you know, because after a while, you know, when, when you live that life too long, you become, whenever there's a slight or whatever, you've got to live up to that that image. You have to live up to that. You, know, you can't take a backward step and you got to strike fast and strike hard. And while I'd gotten to that stage by the time I was going into the program and I was, I was, um, I had a false sense of manna, but it was getting me around in there, you know, I was feared, I was respected, I was loved. I was one of those guys, I became one of those guys that if you talk to me inside in the yard and that you were good, you know. Um, I used to control, we come into the unit, people come and ask them what they're in there for, show me your papers. If they're in for anything untoward that we didn't like, they won't come into our unit. And it was good. I met a lot of good people there. Um, I had a lot of intense psychology, um, psych 101. And it went back to my childhood, bro. I mean, like, stuff that happened, childhood trauma, things that happened uh, when when uh, people outside the family were allowed in, you know, and they'd hurt me, um, abused me, and things like that. And I was carrying that around with me. And, you know, I discovered that that was why I was lashing out, acting the way I was acting, doing what I was doing, that, that the attitude that I had in life. So I was happy to um, be able to address all of that there and, and move forward. When I left there, I was a lot lighter, man. I was a lot lighter than I was when I went in there. You've got to make God your center of your life, you know, and you've got to, you have to be living in harmony with the Holy Spirit, bro. That has to be leading you, guiding your heart, talking to your heart, and you got to read the word every day, bro. You know, you got to stand on it. That's the rock. That's what's gonna. That's what keeps us solid, bro. When when the devil attacks us, and that, you know, we, the word, you know, bro. You've you've ended up doing the um almost eighteen, bro. Almost two bricks you spent in there, bro. I mean, how, how was it when that parole came up, man? And, and you got those papers that you're getting your parole, brother. How was all that for you? I was, I'd been up to five pro boards already. Sit down, sixth one. And then I went up on this one. I felt like, you know, by that time I was, I was in the right place with God. I was in a good place with Him. Uh, we had communion, the whole balance. 
was going through, I, I kind of knew, you know, when I went up, you know, when you're with him, bro, you're not, you're not very, really, you don't worry anymore, you know, you don't, you don't stress about stuff anymore when, when you're right with God. When you're good with God, he sends people your way that, that are going to, you know, they're going to help you be who he wants you to be all the time. And I was walking to that board and I, I knew, you know, I had a, God, I had peace, bro. You know, I looked at my family, looked at my mom and said, they, the, the way they reacted, you know, my mom and dad and my sister and my partner, there was, you know, I'd lost my, I went through some losses, bro. I've got to say this. That was part of what, what started to change in me. I lost my little sister. She's the one person in this world who knew me inside out, you know. I grew up with her. I, I didn't have a brother. I had two sisters, one older and one younger. So I raised the younger one like a brother. I was like, I haven't got a brother, but you're going to be my brother. So we went around, scrapped together. You know, dudes come, we'll, she'll jump in, we'll, we'll scrap them. And she was like a tomboy, bro. <laughs> she ended up marrying this cool dude, this Fijian bloke, good dude. They had two sons. And then, and then she passed away, bro, 2019 or so. So I was devastated, bro. When that happened, I was devastated, but I was still deep in the, you know, still deep in the game, bro. But I was like, there's something clicked in me, bro, you know? Because I've got two teenage sons, um, nephews now. Uh, my son's older, he's okay, but, you know, they don't have a mum now, so I know they're going to be lost, you know? So I had to make some sort of changes as, as well. And I can't lead them on another path. I, you know, I want the, I want this this thing to to end with me, and my generation. I want the kids after me to be better, to be in a better place. You know. So I lost her, got out. Um, happy as not long after that, lost dad. Had seven months with dad, lost him. Uh, six months later, we lost my partner's dad. And. So, you know, within this year and a bit that I've been out, we've been through a lot of stuff, bro, you know. And we got COVID and then we recovered and then now we got babies. So we're like, you know. But God's um, God's hand is at work in my life, bro, you know. Um, he's putting these people in my life where, you know, like, I set my heart and my mind to trust in him, bro, fully, you know, like, fully. I know who I am. I know what I can do. But... I, I set my heart and my mind to trust in God, bro. You know, and since then, he's just been faithful. He's just like he's just been showing me. He's like, you show me, I'll show you. You know, I'll be showing up, bro. Now, nah, Lord, I don't know what I can do. Just there's, there's this pathway here. I can take it. My whole life has been pointing towards it, and you know, it's there. But I know that you want me to do something else, and I'm I'm, I'm trusting in you. And wherever you lead me, Lord, wherever you take me, I'm going. You know, I'm going, I'm going all in. And this is the pathway, you know, he's bringing people into my life. He's been Betani, um, David Telly, you, um, other people in the government agencies that have met us and they want to help us to do what we want to do, enable us to help these youths, help these youngsters change their thinking, help these youngsters come to their senses, help these youngsters find another pathway besides gangs, besides, besides drug dealing, and uh, end up somewhere better than the prison system, bro. Mm -hmm. And if 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 I'm able to help one child, one one youth, one, I know we're gonna help heaps, bro. I know we're gonna rechange this thing, and people wanna start hating on it because it's working, and it's making it's moving mountains, bro. So that's you know we weren't born to fit into stuff, bro. We weren't here to fit. We were here to shine, bro. We were here to to go against the grain to move the mountains, bro. So. You know, if anyone we we qualify, bro. You know, so well, this this program that we want to run and this this the service we want to provide, I want it to start into start at schools. Uh, so that's the, the new leaf, eh? So that's new leaf, new leaf. So we, we turn a new leaf, and, and we want to we want to do something different. And a lot of people are like Dave. Dave's doing different. He's what he does is different. Dave, tell it. It's different from what everyone else is doing because he's got the people that are facilitating his programs. 
of people who've been through the life, turned it, they found the Lord, they turned it over, and they can speak from experience to other people who are still going through it. You know what I mean? And they, they drop the word in there, man. They drop the word in at the right time, and it's just like, boom, you know, the word, and it resonates, you know, as truth in, in the hearts of the men, and they are receptive to it, which is awesome to see, bro. Um, can't wait to get started with these youths. Um, I want to start in the schools, talk to the kids in the schools that are thinking of going down that track and not quite there. Go to the youth prisons because we're going to miss some of the ones in the schools that are going to end up in the system. Pick them up there. If we miss them in the schools, we'll see them again in the youth prisons. And then if we miss them there, have a program for, about fatherhood and that um, in the adult division, you know. So, you know, you know, uh, with God on our side, we can do anything, bro. They talk about red tape and all this and that. God can break down those, he will break down those walls or those jails, bro. He will break them down. I'm, I'm going to do, I can't see myself doing anything else, bro. You know, uh, it's this. I just want to be happy. I just want to feed feed my family. I just want to do what God wants me to do in life. You know, his will. Because everything else he takes care of, bro. We're just doing it hard trying to go out and do all the other stuff. You know, let go and let God. He's, he's his plan for us is a future, hope, prosper. You know, it's the other guy. The other guy is here to steal, kill, and destroy, bro. And the longer we stay in that life, that's what we're going to be doing. You know, stealing, killing, destroying the futures of other people, other kids. Look, brother, I mean, we're coming to the end here, man. So, um, brother, I really appreciate your time jumping on, man, and, and taking that time out, bro. I know that that's a big step, bro. You know what I mean? For you to come out here and and um and share a bit of your life um on here, man, for, for people to um to be inspired by. It's just um man, I'm wishing you nothing but the best and all of that, bro. I mean, would you do you got any closing remarks, bro, before we wrap uh, wrap this up? Any other messages that you might have to any brothers or sisters that you might know, bro, in prison or anything like that, bro? Any words of encouragement? Yeah, I do actually, bro. I, uh, they tell us that um they say that prison is where the scum of the earth go to, or the losers or the drop kicks of society. They say that that's, that's what prison is, but, but it's not, man. Prison is like God's jewelry box, man. You know, that's his jewelry box. And then there he's got diamonds, he's got rubies, he's got sapphires and that. And he's polishing them up. He's polishing you all up. And when you come out of there, you know what happens is when the light, hits the diamond or hits the sapphire whatever it spreads bro it like spreads in multiple areas. every area of your life is going to be blessed every area of your life you're going to be a blessing to people and um, and, um, and and it will flow on and it will flow on and that's how he works and you'll meet other people and um, yeah so Take advantage of that time if you're sitting in there or if you've just come out. Um, pray. Pray. Talk to God. Pick up your Bible. Have a look at it, man. Uh, all the answers to the world's problems are in there. I don't know why we have so many problems, bro. The leaders aren't reading their Bibles, bro. That's right, bro. They're not teaching it in schools, bro. That's where the dramas are coming from, mate. You know what I mean? Once you take the word of God away, Mate, right. this goes downhill. I mean, 2018, they took Jesus Christ's name out of Parliament prayer in this country. And it, now, it now, went, look. now look, brother. Now look at what's going on. Get right with God, brothers and sisters. Get right with God. And he will send people into your life. He will send everyone that comes to your is sent. And we will recognize who the enemy has sent in our pathways. So, yeah, get right with God, everyone, man. So, um, my doko, brother, thank you for jumping on, man. Um, well wishes and all of that, bro. And um, we'll talk soon anyway, my brother. Really?